Welcome to the All About You podcast. My name is Sheila and I am your host. In this podcast, I invite everyday people to tell their stories of their travels, passions and what makes them happy. So if you have a story to tell, please contact me on allaboutyoupodcast at yahoo.com and let's tell your story. So now for today's conversation. Welcome to another conversation on the All About You podcast. And this afternoon, I've got two guests. I've got Matthew and Ben from Simply Spanish Wines. So welcome to the All About You podcast. Hi, Sheila. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sheila. Great to see you. Lovely to have two guests. It's a bit of a treat for me, this is. So, okay, let's begin by talking about how you two met and how you came up with Simply Spanish Wines. So we um, we actually met when we were both working at the British Embassy here in Madrid, quite some years ago, actually, um, about 15 years ago, I think. It yes, was. we've been friends for, friends for a long time. A long time, yeah. And um, Matthew was working on the um, uh, agricultural and environment side there, and I was working on the communication side. Um, and we actually, we basically just used to go for coffees quite a lot. <laughs> um, and um, we'd uh, we'd sit and, as you do, over coffees or even over lunch, we just chat about what we were doing outside of work. And um, often the, the 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 topic of wine used to come up uh, an awful lot because we were both very very much into it. Mm. Yeah, we've always been very keen uh, consumers and enthusiasts of wine. And I, because of what I was doing, I was doing a lot of. I was, I was based in Madrid working, but I used to travel around a lot to, to kind of rural parts of Spain and I would be visiting, uh, you know, farms and, and, and cooperatives and some of those would be covering uh, vineyards and, and, and the wine sector. And I just kind of fell into it as I found, started to find out more and more about how it, how it all operated and how it worked and the huge diversity of, of wine that there is in this country. And yeah, Ben and I would, would you know talk about these things and compare it to the some of the wines that we were drinking uh, in in Madrid in in sort of bars and restaurants around the place. And slowly but surely, this idea uh, evolved as we as we realised what a what a what a wine revolution the country was was really going through and how much uh, how much how many fantastic uh, growers and producers there there are. Mm. And I think from my side of it, because I was coming at it from more of a consumer's point of view, um, I was very aware of the fact that there, there was, as Matthew was saying, there was at least almost an explosion in the way in which uh, in the, the wine term Spain was producing, the variety and the quality. Um, but I was a little bit lost in it all uh, at the outset. I think like a lot of people, I, I just wasn't quite sure where to where to approach it from, how to get the most out of it where to start, where to taste new wines and that kind of things. And, you know, you could go along to a few tastings every now and then. Um, but ultimately, um, I, I spent a lot of time learning about wine, reading up about wine, um, visiting different parts of Spain and tasting different wines. But I was very conscious of the fact that not everyone can do that. Um, and, and we both felt that there was an awful lot of wine in Spain of really good quality, really good variety and really good prices um, that a lot of people could be missing out on. Um, if they weren't actually able to or had the time to or didn't even know where to begin to do that kind of research and investigation. And it was really, I think, from there that the germs of Simply Spanish wine started to started to emerge. And we should I should say we also before before Simply Spanish wine, we did this 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 sort of voyage of discovery that we were on. It, it, it ended up in us creating, setting up a, a, a wine export business. Um, about five years ago, um, really focusing on small to medium sized producers and getting some of those unknown wines uh, in the UK, getting them into the UK. So we started a, a B2B, a business to business operation to, well, not export at the time, it was moving wine from one European country, Spain, to, to another European country at the time, so the UK, um, and selling selling wines by the pallet really to the UK wine trade, who then you know were distributing them on to uh, primarily to kind of bars and restaurants and hotels. What in the trade is known the on trade as opposed to the the off trade, which would be uh, bricks and mortar shops. Um, so that's really how we how we started, and then that export business has slowly evolved, and we've added to it uh, a B to C, a business to consumer 
side of things, which is simply Spanish wine, which is what we're talking about today. It's a really interesting story because right at the beginning, you said that you two used to go out for a coffee together. So mm-hmm. we could have been having a conversation about your coffee business, but no. <laughs> I think with wines, the average person, we go into the supermarket, we're looking for a bottle of wine, we've got guests for lunch, guests for dinner, or we go into somebody's. We normally pick up the same bottle of wine for drinking at home. We generally know what we like and we're quite happy with it. Whenever we have people coming round or we're taking wine to someone's house, I get that fear in the pit of my stomach. And I always say to my husband, go and get something good. I'm a white wine drinker and I I will come on to this because I've got a couple of questions about being a white wine drinker. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people just get that fear when we have to go and sort of represent ourselves with a bottle of wine. You know, we don't want the person we're taking the wine to to go, oh, my God, she has got no idea. We don't want them to think we've she's just gone and bought the most expensive bottle of wine known to man. And I think it's this fear of the unknown. We think wine is very complex. We feel it's a little bit scary. And as you say, unless we take the time to educate ourselves or go on a course, we're just in the dark. So what I particularly like about your website is the focus on education. So can you talk about the idea of educating us? Yeah, sure. And and I think, I mean, it, it is um, the definitely one of our aims is to try to remove that fear and to demystify wine and to simplify that whole process of choosing a bottle. And, and we could say the word educate, it, but it feels a little bit, almost a little bit stuffy to talk about education. We're just trying to to share some, yeah. some knowledge with people um, and to help people get a better idea of how to make a decision when they're faced with multiple bottles of wine. So the idea behind the website, the idea behind Simply Spanish Wine, and it's in the name, Simply, is to, is to try to make this whole process a bit more simple. It, it's about trying to give people some basic knowledge about the way wine is made, about the way different grapes um, impact the flavour and aroma of a wine that you end up buying, how different regions impact the wine that you're buying and then to be able to start making some basic decisions based on what they want what they like um, rather than on what is a good wine or a bad wine just on what it is that they like about a particular bottle of wine so if you if you are a white wine drinker and you know that you like quite um, crisp fresh fruity wines, then um, to be able to open you up to the idea that you could open, you could maybe get a bo- bottle of white from Galicia or a bottle of white from Rueda uh, or a bottle of white from Rioja and understand what the differences are or might be between those wines is, is what we're trying to achieve. Um, keeping it simple, keeping it basic, but to allow people to have a basic knowledge about what goes into a bottle of wine and what that means when it comes to choosing which one you might like to try based on your own personal tastes. Yeah. And I think also about, and you, know, you, you, you said this a lot, Matthew, haven't you, the, the, the whole the dinner party idea of, of going around with a, with a bottle of wine and, and the, the fear of it being a good bottle or not. I think actually what's really, what's really nice is to be able to turn up at somebody's house with a bottle of wine or have someone turn up at yours with a bottle of wine and and have a story to tell about mm, it. Exactly, exactly. Something that something that you haven't seen before, a facet of the wine that's new. I mean, I could very I completely get what you're saying there, Sheila, about the the supermarket, the kind of wall of wine, the indiscriminate wall of wine in the supermarket, with you know, depending on where you are, not much labelling to help you decide or, or see different regions even. Um, never mind, um, you know, grapes or wine styles or whatever. So it's it's helping, as Ben says, it's help it's helping demystify and simplify all of that process and give people the 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 tools, if you like, to help them almost um, explain to themselves why it is they like a particular wine, perhaps more than one other wine. Not because it's a competition, because it isn't, but because we think that's actually really interesting and really good fun if you 
know that, as you know, Ben said, if you know that you like crisp whites, then it's it's very it's very helpful, I think, for for you to be able to sort of recognise some of the characteristics that help go towards make making a wine which is crisp, um, and so that you can repeat it in other in other parts of Spain or in other parts of the world, whether it be New World or Old World, whether it be in you know in Europe or in Australia or New Zealand or South Africa, wherever you happen to be. Um, so it's about it's about giving people those tools to help them guide themselves a little bit and 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 and, and maximize the pleasure for themselves. And hey, you know, if they end up in that dinner party situation, it's not a competition, but it is a, it, it wine is an interesting thing in itself. It's it's you know some someone who I can't remember who said wine is geography in a bottle, and it is wine is geography in a bottle, and being able to uh, examine and understand that geography, why why it is that wine made in one place is going to taste different to wine made in another. And of course, that that kind of dynamic is changing all the time with things like climate change, for example. That's really, really interesting um, information, I think, where we, we spend more and more time uh, as a society involved in, in leisure you know, and gastronomy and, and wine is, is a big part of that journey. So the more the, the better equipped we we feel we are, I think the more the more fun that journey is going to be. Mm, definitely, and and I think uh, you, you you I think you've been on our, our site, Sheila. But um, you know the the aim is to to give very specific examples. We've got three videos up there at the moment: one on Godello, one on Berejo, one on Albarino. Three different grapes that make white wine, uh, and people can go on watch those videos, and they'll get an understanding of each of those three grapes. They're only about two or three minutes long. It's not. So, huge lectures or anything but they'll get an understanding of each of those three grapes what types of wine that they they produce and as a result of that maybe next time that they go into the shop or if they choose to buy one on our website grade when they're faced with a wine that says Albarino and one that says Verdejo and one that says Godeo they'll have a better idea of what the difference is between the three and they'll make an informed choice rather than a just a random guess or go on price. Mm. It's very interesting, Ben, you should mention Verdeco because I discovered this probably about a year ago and I was just given this nice glass of wine and I just thought, actually, this is really, really nice. And had a look at the bottle and yes, it's Verdeco. So now when I go to a restaurant and it, you know, there's a Verdeco, oh, I actually feel one step higher up that I know something about wines. Can I ask a question? Years and years ago, when you went to a restaurant, if you were having meat, it was a red wine. If you were having fish, it's a white wine. OK, that was the rule. I'm a white wine drinker. Now, I have a question. Some people can enjoy a red as equally as they can enjoy a white. I enjoy a glass of white. I cannot even get past the smell of a glass of red wine to try it. And everybody says, Sheila, try this red wine. It's really lovely. I don't know whether it's something to do with my sense of smell or when I do taste the wine. I don't enjoy a red. So it's a question about palate. Are some people able to switch red and white quite happily? Are some people, I mean, my husband is a red wine drinker. I'm a white wine drinker and he will never touch white and I never touch red. Is this anything to do with our palates? Well, it's interesting you should say that. I mean, I have a similar division in, in, in our household, actually. My wife doesn't tend to stick with white and I tend to, to stick with red. Um, and you know, there are people out there who will say that, that, that women tend to have a a finer, more sophisticated palate than men. And certainly if you look in around the Spanish wine scene, there are lots of um, women in charge of very, very high level, very high profile vineyards and very involved in the, kind of the sommelier community and the sort of wine professional tasting circuit. So I think there is something in, in, in the sensitivity of, of women's palates versus, versus men's palates. But to answer your question, I don't think uh, it's something that you should approach as a competition. If you like drinking white wine, um, then my advice to you would be don't get hung, sort of hung up on the old adage, uh, white wine with fish, red wine with meat, because I don't think that's, uh, th that's not very helpful. Um, 
what I what I would encourage you to do, perhaps, is if you like um, your white wine, investigate a, a little bit the the breadth of the, the the white wine offer that's out there. So don't um, just stick perhaps with white, you know, fresh young white wines of the current vintage. So you know, currently in your supermarket when your wine shop, you're going to have a, you know, a, the, the latest release is going to be from 2020. Start looking perhaps at wines that have a, an older vintage on the bottle, because that is a, probably a good indicator that they have spent a little bit more time either sitting, once the wine has been fermented, either sitting on the lees, the, if you like, the dead yeast cells, which lie at the bottom of the fermentation tank when wine is made, and that helps to give the wine a little bit more body and make it a bit creamier. And some people would argue that makes turns it into a bit more of a gastro wine, a wine that you might feel more comfortable drinking sitting down with a nice piece of fish. Or you might take it one step further and look for a, a wine perhaps that has been fermented in, had some contact with wood. It might have been uh, fermented in the barrel. So it might say in Spanish, it might say on the label, fermentada en barrica, and there'll be lots of wines from... Uh, from Rioja like that. I mean, the most famous perhaps is from the, the Tondonia vineyard, the, the Tondonia whites, which are kind of in, in international wine circles. Their reputation is, is going up very, very quickly. And people are talking about these being fantastically good value wines. I mean, they are very expensive wines because a lot has gone into their to their their, their production. Um, but they are they are very much gastronomic wines. They've been in contact with wood. So they've got a lot more complexity, a lot more body. They're a lot more akin, if you like, to a red wine in terms of the, the, the structure of the wine, and they would lend themselves very well to, to you know, to a meatier kinds of fish. You might try look at garnachas, for example, from up in in Catalonia, where again you'll find you will find garnachas that have been um, had some contact with with wood, perhaps not fermented on wood in wood, but maybe aged for a little bit in oak, in oak barrels after after they've been after they've been made, they've been put into oak barrels to ferment. Um, but I wouldn't. I'd, I'd, I'd steer clear of seeing it in terms of, you know, if I if I like white wine but I don't like red, there must be something wrong with me. I mean, I don't think that's I don't think that's the case at all. Mm -hmm. And equally, there'll be people who like like red wines and 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 drink less white wine. I mean, I've certainly and you, you each person evolves. I mean, I've, I'm certainly someone I'd say who, ten years ago, didn't drink very much white wine, and I now find myself. Kind of naturally, really, as the seasons change. I don't know. Yeah. You get to sort of May time, and my uh, el cuerpo me pide, and all my body starts saying it's time to switch. It's time to start drinking white wine as opposed to red. And you're catching us now at a well. When do the clocks go back or forwards? This Saturday. This Saturday. <laughs> this Sunday. Um, you know, I'm starting to to feel that I need a, a glass of red wine. In, in fact, this week I just started. I think <laughs> drinking more red wine, I'd say, than than white wine. But I, th I think it's interesting as well, <clears throat> because the, I think the reverse is true as well. And uh, we traditionally think of red wines as being big and full bodied and fruit mm. and wood and tannins and heavy, something that's really heavy and wintry in a glass. But actually, and particularly in particularly in Spain, there are there is such a, a breadth of red wine production going on. And you're getting you're finding some really, really good light red wines that would that are uh, drink really really well chilled and could quite easily and um, certainly if you were doing food pairing sit in place of a white wine oh. a more full-bodied white so there's there's much less it's much less black and white so it's a lot more gray i think these days yeah. um and, and certainly uh i i have no problems again i think um in like most households i think there's a bit more of a split between white and red in my household as well um, but I, I have no problem. We'll only get a bottle of wine if we go out for dinner, one between us. And I have no problem getting a white wine for the full meal. Um, the only thing is, as Matthew was saying, you choose a white wine that's perhaps a bit more full bodied so that it actually stands up against a slightly more um, robust plate of meat if there is one in there. Um, but it's those sorts of cho uh, choices that we're, we're hoping to be able to enable people to make as they read more of the stuff on our, on our, uh, on our site. And that's a, that's a very good point about chilling, actually chilling red wine, which you know a lot of people um, perhaps don't do um, in the UK. It's not necessarily that common in the UK, but here I'd say it is. It is fairly common. You know, you take a glass, a bottle of red wine, stick it in the fridge for half an hour before 20 minutes, half an hour before you open it, and uh, yeah, it will it will it will benefit from it.
I'm glad you brought that up actually, Matthew, because I was thinking exactly the same thing. In England, we were all very concerned about opening a bottle of red wine, letting it breathe. Some people would even decant it. And now here in Spain, open the bottle and let's chill it before we drink it. So we've gone completely over to the other side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think in, in general, I think, to be honest, one of the things that we're trying to overcome is that, that I think that there are a lot of not so much myths, but there are lots of traditions that we hold um, on the British side, at least, about how to drink wine and what's the right thing to do and what's the wrong thing to do. And I think one of the wonderful things about being here in Spain is it, it teaches you that there is there's less it's less about right and wrong it's more about understanding what it is that works for you and enjoy it and enjoy it exactly enjoy. i mean that's the most important thing but i think over over the years wine has been a little bit stuffy and you know if you go to a restaurant don't order the most expensive don't order the cheapest go something in the middle and you know hopefully the the wine waiter won't look down at you and think oh god mm. these people haven't got a clue so it's good to know things are changing you know the world of wine is not sounding quite so scary now i have to say <laughs> um can we talk a little bit about where you find your wines you're, you're building relationships with local bodegas and suppliers and vineyards yeah absolutely but before we do just just picking up on that point about the restaurants i think it's it, it, it is one that we hear an awful lot and i think it's important to try to put this across it, we don't worry about what the waiter will think of us when we order a curry. There's, there's a, a huge amount of complexity in, in Indian cuisine. There's a, an awful lot of ingredients that go into it. There's a lot of unknowns and sometimes you don't know what you're going to get. But either way, we're, we're willing to take a few risks. We're, we're willing to experiment. We learn as we go. Um, but we don't feel uh, intimidated by a curry menu. To be honest, the only the only real difference between that and wine is that the wine is slightly more expensive than a plate of curry is. But ultimately, you're going there as a consumer to enjoy a good evening out, to have something that you that, that tastes good. Why why should we feel intimidated by it? Why should we feel that there is there is something scary about ordering the bottle of wine that we don't feel about ordering the main course? And I think that's what we'd like to try and help people to overcome, um, because ultimately it's just something that's going to be poured into your glass and you're going to enjoy. And also, I think increasingly, if you, you know, the job of sommeliers or wine waiters in the past, perhaps it wasn't it wasn't emphasised enough during the training that you know your job is to help the customer, uh, <laughs> you know, it's to look very smart and intimidate the customer. Now, I would say from you know the sommeliers that, that we know and we've met, um, the emphasis is shifted the other way, and you know, that person's job is to to help and guide you. So I think increasingly, you know, if I go to a restaurant throw yourselves on the mercy of the sommelier and he or she will be delighted to yeah. help you and guide you you know if you if you say well i normally drink i don't know sauvignon blanc but i don't want a sauvignon blanc. i want something similar but slightly different help me you know, i'm looking for something in this price range you know they're professionals they've studied for uh, a, a very long time to get to, to get the knowledge and to get the job that they've got use it yeah, it's part of the service. It's there. It's a free asset. Make the most of it. So let's talk about then your relationship with the bodegas, the growers, the process, etc. Yeah, sure. So I think I mean this this all started sort of in our in our uh, our first phase, if you like, the export business when we were um, traveling around Spain. And I think the first thing to say is, as anyone who's lived in Spain for a while will appreciate. Spanish people are incredibly generous with their time. Uh, it's one of the things I would say that makes this country different to lots of lots of other others. Um, and it is, I would say, incredibly easy, but it's relatively easy to, you know, ring somebody up, introduce yourself, and go and physically go and see them and spend one, two, three hours with them. They will show you their, their their vineyards. They will show you their winery. They will explain, you know, the family history, their father, their grandfather, etc. And you will come away having learned a huge amount. And we did a lot of that. We spent a long time attending taste. We're very lucky in Madrid because there are there is a pre pre COVID certainly there was a a big and varied tasting 
uh, circuit. So every every week, basically, when you know when we first started, every week there were probably two big tasting events for the trade in Madrid. So we could very quickly we could get a a sense of, of everything that was out there without moving very far from our houses. Um, and as we as our knowledge grew, we did we started jumping in the car and traveling up to Galicia or up to Catalonia or down south or wherever it happened to be. And gradually we built up as we built up a uh, a better sense of what it is that we liked and what we thought our clients might like, which is not necessarily the same thing. We were able to sort of start filtering that by by then quite thick book of, of wine trade contacts that we had here in in Spain. So it was a it was a very uh, it wasn't it wasn't a virtual network building. It was very much a physical one to one. Putting a putting a face to a name, which, as you know, in here is is very important. It's also true that the uh, certainly the people that we've met along the way, but uh, I think it's true in general of the Spanish wine sector. The people are so enthusiastic and passionate about what they do and what they're doing that they genuinely just want to share it with you. You know, we the, the excitement that that we've seen with people when they're just showing us around a plot. And pointing out the different vine trees that they have, or the pointing out the stories behind um, why or how they've developed the, the the growth cycle that they have, or the the harvesting practices that they have. Um, we were up in one uh, one vineyard, and they were showing us some, some Roman ruins that they have next to the next to one of the plots. Uh, it was an old um, stone press, mm -hmm. if I remember rightly, that they've just left there because it was part of the heritage of the vineyard. And these these sorts of things are, are it's what they want to share, but it's what they're putting into their wine as well. Mm. Um, and it's it's so important, we think, to try to get that across to people that they, this is not factory produced wine. These are families that go back generations mm. that have been making wine and that they're, they're trying new things or they're trying to replicate what their grandfathers did, but in, in each in their own way. They're putting their their sort of heart and soul into the production of the, of the of their product and into the production wine. It's great to be able to share that with them, but we we really feel almost beholden to try to put some of that across as well when we're talking about the wines and when we're trying to introduce other people to those wines. That that story behind them as well as just the the physical contents of the bottle. And they are they're, they're you know they're oral stories. They're not necessarily written down anywhere. They're telling you about a specific bit of geography and they're telling you. Its history over the last several several generations. It's fascinating. Mm. Yeah, I mean the passion the passion of people is is very is a very important aspect. It's a it's a it's a risky business, and in, in you know there, there are people who perhaps you know finished their their studies of, of uh, agronomy at the university, and they had a choice. They could they could choose a, a kind of younger generation, a new generation urban lifestyle, or they could say no, I come from a specific region, a specific wine growing area. I'm going to go back and I'm going to resuscitate the vineyard that perhaps has lain fallow for my parents' generation, but my grandparents used to farm. I'm going to give it a go. And it's it's a very, there's an awful lot of people doing that. That generational shift is, is very interesting. The number of wine growers who are um, developing a profile in Spain and internationally who are perhaps no more, you know, they're in their mid, mid to late 30s. I mean, that's really interesting to hear because, as you say, Ben, you said growing wine is a risky business. And, and Matthew, you're saying young people now are taking the opportunity to, to work with the family business or, or to, to renovate what is something that's been maybe dormant. So hearing these individual stories so that we can enjoy a nice glass of wine with our loved ones and our family and friends. Mm. So you have now rec very recently got your online shop up on your website so can we talk a little bit about that and of course we've got Christmas just just around the corner yes yeah, so we've um, we, we've launched the the online shop went live just uh, about a week ago um, so it's very early days at the moment um, but the idea behind it is um, obviously we this is a community for for wine lovers and we want to help people to understand um, and grow their knowledge of Spanish wine. But at the same time, we want to be able to at least make some sort of a living out of it um, so that we can carry on doing it, basically. Um, 
So we started off with um, a very carefully selected group of wines, which we think are representative of the, the a bit like the philosophy that we got behind the, the, the whole project. The idea that we want to introduce people to wines that um, either that they may not have tried before because they're from regions that wouldn't necessarily be represented in the local supermarket, um, or even if they're familiar with them, they are from um, these kinds of, uh, of wineries. They're from small, um, small uh, producers, uh, family run in most cases, people who are trying to do something slightly different, slightly modern, uh, slightly out of the uh, out of the norm with the wines that they're producing. But at the same time, that they're an accessible selection of wines. We're we're not going out to, and trying to. Mm sell people weird and wonderful wines that they're, they're never going to want to taste again. We think that these are really, really good, accessible wines, both in terms of their profile, but also in terms of the prices that they're at. Mm. Um, and that we think will give people a chance to take some of the articles and videos that we put online and apply some of the learning to the, the wines that they've got in front of them. So they can pick up a bottle and say, OK, I saw something about this on one of the videos. Let's try it. Let's see if I can recognize uh, what Ben or Matthew were saying in their in their last video on Rioja, Rios Baixas, or on Tempranillo. So yeah, those are those are the ones we've put together. And we've tried at the beginning, at least, to have a a bit of a, ge a broadish geographical coverage. So we've started off with wines from. I mean, it, it, to be fair, it, it's all it all tends to be wines in the northern half of the country. I mean, obviously, there are some fantastic wines produced in southern Spain, as we all know, and the whole, of course, the whole sherry story, which is subject for another, you know, another conversation. It's a, a wonderful, wonderful world, the world of sherry. But we've, we've started with wines grown sort of from east to west in the northern half of Spain. So we've got wines from southern Catalonia, from Rioja, from different bits of Galicia in the northwest. And from from Rueda around around Valladolid, mm -hmm. that we're talking about. But our intention is certainly to expand outwards in, in terms of our offer from there, and include wines from you know wonderful places down south, whether that be uh, you know uh, Muyas or Jumilla or, or Sierras de Malaga. I hope to get some 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 sherries in there as well at uh, at some point. So um, yeah, we want to to cover. Our ambition is to is to cover the whole of, of, of Spanish geography. Mm -hmm. And you say that Christmas around the corner. Um, and yes, there are there are some very very good uh, reds on there that would suit the uh, the incoming winter. But at the same time, for uh, for all drinks, we've got a couple of bottles of Cava on there. So if people are looking for a bit of Christmas fizz, there's a couple in there. And also for those you mentioned white before, for those. The white wine drinkers who maybe want to progress a little bit to more more towards the red side of things. Well, we've got a couple of really good rosés in there as well, which is a a nice step toward a, a red without diving into a, a full-bodied, um, barrel-aged Rioja. So yeah, there's a hopefully a selection for everyone on there. So just talking about the website then. So I was having a look, and I think the prices are very very reasonable, and also the shipping charges. At the moment, you're only delivering to mainland Spain and the Balearic Islands, is that right? Correct, yeah. yes. Your handling and shipping charges, I think, were very fair. It's been done by weight. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, um, it's it's not necessarily the, the most common way for people to do it, but ultimately um, the, the the providers that we use, and I think it's quite common in most of the the, um, the logistics trade, is a, a lot of logistics and, and transport is done based on weight. And we felt that we could try to translate that into bottle quantities. Um, but in doing so, we, we risked making things a bit more complicated. Um, and also we risked potentially overcharging people when there was no need to. So we basically just translated what we're getting charged from a delivery company um, into something that we hope is easy to understand and hope is um, a, an acceptable price for people. Um, so yeah, we'll see. But I mean, all of this is it's it's early days, so we'll we'll see how people respond to it. Um, but I think I think we pitched it at the right level. But we'll we'll see what people say. And we do want to keep that simply word in there in terms of the the delivery as well. And make sure that the whole thing is as is as, 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 as easy to, to, to manage from a consumer point of view as possible and that the wines turn up 
you know, the time agreed and, 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 uh, and you can enjoy them as quickly as you can. Yeah, yeah and you, 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 I don't know if you'll have noticed how far you got through the process, but when you get into the checkout or when you put some bottles into the cart on the online website, there is actually, it gives you a, an estimate of how much the shipping is going to be. So mm -hmm. you know up front how much that additional cost is going to be. So again, just trying to keep things clear, transparent and simple for people so they can focus on the wine rather than having to focus on working out how much it's going to cost them at the end. That's a good point, actually, because that's something that we've, you know, as consumers, when I buy online, I always find quite irritating. You know, if I buy something, but it's not until I've actually put in my personal details that I found out I can find out what the shipping charges are going to be. Yeah. And I, I'm a bit I'm a bit cornered at that point. Yeah. Um, you know, whereas we wanted to make it as transparent as possible. People could see, OK, so the total price is going to is going to be X. You know, and they can make a decision without before they put in their, their details. And yeah. I think that's that's important as well in a country like Spain, where I think on, I think I'm right in saying you know, online e-commerce in Spain up until now, people have people haven't necessarily bought that much online, and that's changing. And that's, yes, I think that's that's yeah. something that's changing. Perhaps with with our experience over lockdown, you know, online certainly online wine sales during lockdown have gone up a huge amount here and, and in other countries. Um, so that's all something that makes us feel quite uh, quite optimistic. People are getting more and more used to buying uh, products like wine um, online. And I think as well, the benefit of the wine gets delivered to your front door. Yeah. If we can just finish off the podcast by talking what is in the future, you know, what are you working on now for Simply Spanish Wines? What's on the whiteboard at the moment that you're working on? <laughs> well, um, it, it's very early stages. So at the moment, we're really in startup mode and we are basically focused on getting the word out there. Um, and just letting people know we're here, what we do, and and uh, share some of the uh, the articles, the resources, and also the wine that we've got together. But um, we we really want to, it's an online business. We want to be in touch with people as well. So we really want to get out there. And now that we're we we we're starting to get back into some sort of normality in terms of the movement that we can have around the country. We really want to get out there. We want to be meeting um, both more wine producers, but also we want to be meeting potential customers as well. Yeah. So we're hoping that um, before Christmas we can get out down to some of the costas, um, meet a few people who are working in our trade, potential people who might we might be able to work with, but also end consumers as well. Let's see if we can try and get some tastings on the cards or a um, bit of a roadshow, but it definitely we want to be getting out there and we want to be in touch with people and, and making this as much a, a community as it is an online business. That's a good point, actually. Yeah. The businesses that are out there, we've, we've found that people, we've, you know, we've had already had approaches from people with, let's say, complementary businesses, and whether they may be you know, golf clubs or event organisers, people mm -hmm. saying, what you're doing is interesting. We, there's some synerg potential synergy there. We could organise, or you could organise, come down and organise a wine tasting at one of our events in, I don't know, the province of Malaga, for example, or Girona, or wherever it happens to be. And that's really, really exciting. I, I think this is it. We, we, as you say, Ben, we're, we're hoping we're coming at, to that light at the end of the tunnel now. One thing I've personally missed is all the wine fairs we would have had here in Valencia over the last 18 months. Really miss those. <laughs> Yes, okay. we have to. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say the fact that you can actually get out and, and meet your potential uh, audience would be absolutely fantastic. So any final things you'd like to say? I think probably just to sum up, it, it is this the, the, the thing that we're trying to put across is that wine doesn't have to be difficult. It doesn't have to be complicated and it doesn't have to be intimidating. It's supposed to be something that we enjoy and we, and we do enjoy when we get it open and we stick it in the glass. We enjoy it. We enjoy drinking it. We enjoy sharing it with friends. We enjoy the social element that goes around it. Um, so we're just trying to give people a little bit more confidence and a little bit more knowledge so that they can actually make a choice about the wine that they're drinking and feel a little bit more comfortable stepping outside of the normal bottles that they buy, trying something new and discovering what it is they like and what it is that they don't like. And that's 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 as far as it goes. It's about finding the wine for you and us trying to help you to do that along the way. 
And Matthew, I absolutely love when you said wine is geography in a bottle. I can't claim that statement as my own, Sheila. Someone, <laughs> someone else said it. Someone far, far more intelligent than I said that at some point. But yeah, I think it, it's very, yeah. it's very true. And I think also, I mean, it, as you say, you know, we, we can move around a little bit more now. But even so, not as perhaps not as much as, as as a couple of years ago. And wine does enable you to to do that. It takes you on a bit of a journey. Spain's a big country. We're looking at distances before. Yes. Uh, southeast to northwest, a thousand kilometres. Cadiz to Girona, another thousand kilometres. That's a long. You know, if you're living down on in 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 Murcia, for example, and you want a wine from Galicia, that's a long way to go. It's a completely different climate. There's all sorts of things you can talk about there. If you're living down in Cadiz and you're drinking a garnacha from Terra Alta, that's another thousand kilometres. It's a different climate. It's a different um, different soil type. It's a different winemaking technique. It's different, different, different culture. There are so many different factors that, that come into play. So it's really fascinating. Yeah, and if we can bring a little bit of that, the, those different regions to people where they wouldn't otherwise get a chance to experience them just by opening a bottle of wine, then our job is done. Our job is done. <laughs> ben and Matthew from Simply Spanish Wines, thank you so much for the conversation, the education, keeping us up to speed with what, what you're doing, what's happening in the future, and good luck with the online shop, looking towards seeing how that's going to progress over time. And thank you for being guests on the All About You podcast. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you, Sheila. Sheila. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Yeah. I hope you have enjoyed the conversation. Don't forget, if you have a story you would like to tell, please get in touch. My email address is allaboutyoupodcast at yahoo.com and thank you for listening.